indigenous peoples of Bukidnon have always had this spiritual connection with nature. For one, the land, the forest for that matter, the rivers were all seen as the homes of their the spirits, the guardians. So there was always this consciousness that they should not abuse nature. They should not take more than they need. Unfortunately, that culture is slowly being uh, supplanted by foreign cultures and this connection with the land is also slowly disappearing. It's being replaced by the eagerness to get financial gain no matter what the cost, no matter what the consequence. The environment and our farmers are really dealing with so many problems, whether it be linked to the weather or to social problems or to political problems. There are things as human beings that we can do to kind of just put everything in harmony again and make things better. We're meeting Nico today, who works for such a foundation, who are doing lots of different efforts and different tangents to just try to make nature breathe again, nature livable again, and at the same time help the tribe and the communities. I hope what we show you today will inspire you to do the same. I was born here in Bukidnon to an indigenous family. My grandfather is a tribal Datu chieftain. I've always felt a connection with the province, the land. So growing up, spent a lot of time in the forests. Hearing the stories from my grandparents, you could actually plant three cycles of corn per year. Right now, it's mostly two crops or one and a half. I spent a lot of time in the mountains, going on hikes. I witnessed firsthand the conversion of the land from forest into farmlands. Poultry farms, piggeries, it's really happening at an alarming rate. Nature takes care of itself, basically. We just ruin it. Yes, <laughs> we just ruin it. <laughs> the main purpose of Hinaluban Foundation is to reforest and uh, preserve the existing rainforests of Bukidnon and the watersheds. But to get there, Hinduluban seeks to address first the root cause of deforestation, poverty, hunger, and the lack of economic opportunity in the indigenous communities. Hinduluban Foundation approaches the rainforestation uh, challenge by adopting uh, three steps. The first step, food security plots, 3,000 square meter plot of land per indigenous family. The intention is to provide food for a family of around seven, and that will mean savings for the family. Adlai or aglai in the local dialect used to be a basic staple in the indigenous communities, which used primarily for winemaking and as a source of carbohydrates. There's been a resurgence in the popularity of bad life, particularly because of the increase of lifestyle diseases brought about by improper diets. It's a perennial also, right? Yeah, it's a perennial. So low maintenance, um, less labor involved, and it's a very, very hardy plant, resistant to diseases, to pests, good potential for the community. So, okay. The next step, sustainable disposable source of income. For other areas, that might also mean uh, commercial tree plantations. It's uh, Philippine mahogany or lawaan. So they use this lot for, for timber. It's very, you get a lot of recovery from this. So that's why they would trade, yeah. cut down most of it. Yeah. Then the final step would be to go into rainforestation. And that's where we plant permanent trees intended to rehabilitate and protect the watersheds of Bukidnon. This is uh, one of the ideal species to reintroduce in Bukidnon. But if you plant this outright without preparing the soil, chances are it will either die or it won't be a healthy tree. That's one thing that has been missing from most uh, reforestation efforts, conditioning the soil, bringing it back as close as possible to the na natural to state, natural state yeah. before we introduce the forest species. Okay. I have two small boys and I want them to grow up and to at least be able to see what I'm seeing right now. I want them to experience hiking through the forest, seeing the wildlife on a larger scale. The past few months, uh, the province was in a state of calamity from El Nino. That's something that I don't want my kids to experience growing up. By extension, that's something I don't want the other members of my tribe to undergo as well.
So I was talking to some of the people who are cooking here and they told me with their Paco fern, their baby fern over here, they do this dish where they put a lot of salted egg, some chili, some coconut. So I thought it'd be cool to kind of mix that in with the edline, kind of make like a coconut risotto with some chili, some garlic, uh, some ginger, and then using this green, beautiful Paco fern. So right now I'm just looking for some chilies and I've got this whole kind of just selection of cayenne peppers that are here, which look absolutely fantastic. Just this one is perfect and that's all I need. So I'm not sure what these are, but they taste really sweet and kind of herby, and I thought they'd be a really great complement to the dill and the basil that we'll be adding to our risotto over here. So I'll just grab a couple of these. This is pure aesthetic. Obviously, I'm not sure it's gonna change much of the flavor, but it just looked really pretty. And since I have a really pretty bag, I thought I'd make a really pretty dish for you guys. If I get sick tomorrow, then I'll know they weren't edible. Well, that's how every kind of, that's how you forage, basically, people. You need to test out different plants and flowers and then eventually if you find something's good and something's edible that's where you record everything last finishing touches i'm just going to use some baby dill right here and this with the coconut cream is actually a really good combination that not a lot of people kind of use um, but i think it's going to be really flavorful just a little bit as well just to go perfectly with our flowers I like the idea and the notion of thinking that food actually can heal, right? And to think that this grain, this new grain, well, this old grain that's newly being introduced can change a lot of things really is kind of a sign of hope. And I think it's, it's something that's great for Filipino agriculture, not only for our farmers, but also just a more viable economic kind of environment. Today, I thought it'd be really fun to, to use a foreign kind of application to rice, which is a risotto, to kind of recreate that, but then using local flavors. Picked up some little baby fern, some paco a while ago. Usually just boil it and then stir fry it with some coconut milk, some chili, some garlic, some ginger, typical Filipino flavors, adding some salted egg and stuff for that to it. So I thought, why not merge those two things together and kind of try to come up with a dish that's completely different, yet tastes very familiar and very local, but using a grain in a very modern way so we can introduce it to the you know, to the world. Hopefully it catches on and goes everywhere. So here what I'm gonna do is just kind of just shock boil it into my broth. This should take about three to five minutes, not too long. When you cook outside or when you make food outside and you're actually kind of forced or able to pick some vegetables and herbs outside, it does really make you feel like you're actually having some sort of interaction with nature rather than being in a high rise all the time and just being, you know, pushed into polluted environments. Once you see it, that it gets nice and almost vibrant, that's exactly where we want to get it to. So I'm gonna go ahead and just scoop all these out. In my pan here, a little bit of olive oil, and then we're gonna grab a couple cloves of garlic. Then we're gonna chop up one red onion. Then I'm gonna quickly add just a couple small slices of my red chili here, just to give us some nice heat. Then I'm gonna go ahead and grab my light, mix that all together, tiny bit of salt. And then what we're gonna do is slowly kind of ladle in our chicken stock until everything is nicely covered. So as the edlai kind of absorbs all that liquid, you wanna keep adding more until you get it to a consistency that you're happy with. These will just puff up nicely and become nice, round, and beautiful. Add in some of my fresh sage without chopping it because I'm gonna fish this out later just to really give us a nice kind of herbal flavor to the whole dish. All right, to finish everything off, you guys know I love my salads. So I've got some fresh spearmint here. To that, I'm gonna put in some basil, and then we're gonna add a little bit of dill as well. Take some salt, a tiny bit of olive oil. A tip to an always creamy risotto is always finish with butter. So right when it's about to be ready, you just fold in some nice butter. And Italian grandmothers always say a true risotto shouldn't be clumpy, but should actually form waves as you mix it around. If it's something that detaches or something that's too liquid, you won't get that same consistency that we're getting right now. My bowl out, pour in all my risotto. Then I'm gonna go ahead and grab a little bit of my fresh coconut milk. So usually a risotto you'd finish with a little bit of cheese. Here the coconut milk is just gonna give me an awesome consistency. Some of my fern goes right on top. My mixed herb salad. So take some of the dill, some basil, some spearmint just so you really get all that brightness that cuts through all that coconut creaminess. And then we're gonna use these tiny little sweet flowers that we found in the garden a while ago. A little bit of my McCormick black pepper here, some paprika just for some smokiness. Got a gorgeous salted duck egg here. This is traditionally used in salads. People like it with a lot of tomatoes and onions, some of that paco. So this is kind of just like a reinterpretation of something that's already so delicious and so good. Finish everything off with just a tad bit of olive oil. 
and you've got this gorgeous East meets West Filipino ad light risotto. We are the architects of our own demise. We create and fuel a society where people always strive for more. We aren't happy with today, so we look forward to tomorrow, always forgetting that today systematically becomes tomorrow. People are pushed to adopt new systems and adapt themselves to high capitalistic demands just to keep up with the madness. How does this affect our traditional farmers? No, not the ones who produce solely for trade, but the ones who grow to eat. They are thrust into our rhythm, our drumbeats, our incessant need for riches, creating a drunk thirst for advancement. We come on our noisy workhorses, logging their lands, stripping it of its purity, not to feed to survive, but to produce, to mechanize, and ultimately to entertain. In some ways, you could say that this is a necessary evil, and I would agree with you. Aren't we all hardwired for progression? But what is progress without sustainability? It's an unfinished roller coaster. The thrill is present, the collision of air on your face, and for a few lustful seconds, you're flying before plummeting faster than you rose. We all need to come to terms with the fact that what we are doing is not right. The faster we do this, the easier we can determine how to balance the development, the preservation of our earth, and the rediscovery of our indigenous knowledge. As we close this series, all I ask of you is to look at yourself what you do, how you go about your day, and wonder how you can have less of a negative impact on the soil on which you stand. Once you've understood where you can improve, bring this message to those directly around you. Spread the seed and watch the regrowth begin. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the Landscape series. Make sure to backtrack and check out all our previous episodes. We did one about pork, one about honey, one about natural fertilizers, one about freshwater fishing, and this one.